very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the registered delegates uh, who are watching us live on this Zoom platform. On behalf of Executive Council, Board of Directors, IAPD, and myself, I extend heartiest welcome to all of you to this webinar on this uh, platform of virtual knowledge. I'm Virender Goel, Chair, Education Committee, International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm really honored and feeling great to share this virtual platform of knowledge with today's speaker. Before I take opportunity of introducing you all with, it, with today's speaker, I would like to inform you that these IPD webinars are absolutely free for all. By chance you have missed uh, this live streaming, uh, you can watch the video recording of uh, this webinar on IPD website going into the e-learning section, but those videos are only available for the members of IPD. Now, I feel very special, very honored and privileged to introduce you all with today's speaker. She is none other than Dr. Marina Papakroni. She is uh, a graduate from Dental School of University of Athens. She did her graduation in 1995. Then she completed a three-year postgraduate program and received her pediatric dentistry specialization certificate in 1999. And in 2001, she uh, was conferred with two years master's degree in dental material from the same university. After that, she is very active member of uh, Hellenic Society of Pediatric Dentistry, European Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and of course, International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. She was a member of uh, PR Committee of uh, International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. And uh, in 2023, she has become board member of IAPD and chairperson of Public Relations Committee, International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. She is into private practice more than two decades, roughly 24 years she has completed into private practice. And uh, she has a very um, much interest in the field of aesthetic and microscopic pediatric dentistry. She is an instructor at postgraduate clinic of pediatric dentistry department of uh, Athens University. And uh, she has lectured in different topics of pediatric dentistry worldwide. Um, dear colleagues, dear Virinder, uh, please accept my deepest gratitude, uh, not only from for the introduction, but also uh, to IAPD for their kind invitation. Um, also, I couldn't have done this webinar without the advice and assistance of our uh, Secretary General, Anne Viero, and uh, our President, Figen uh, Sein. Um, as you already know from our media and also our uh, monthly, monthly newsletter, the topic of uh, today's uh, webinar uh, is the missing part of uh, class two, the cavity preparation and uh, bars armamentarium. And um, that's uh, why uh, you see uh, in your screen the missing part of uh, a trireme from uh, Acropolis um, Museum. Um, when we speak about the workflow of uh, a class two um, restoration, Usually, uh, we don't focus so much uh, to the first steps, which is the cavity preparation and our armamentarium. And um, what we believe is that uh, class two 
uh, it is a very easy procedure because it is very common, but actually I feel that uh, the class tool is one of the most challenging situations in pediatric restorative uh, dentistry. Uh, also, uh, our uh, seminar webinar today is uh, sponsored by Microcopy and all uh, the materials used uh, in this webinar are from uh, Microcopy. This is one of my favorite photos and um, I like to call it uh, the troupe because it is like a group of actors and actresses making the performance uh, in front of um, a brightly lighted window. But the truth is that this is uh, one of my photos uh, in front of uh, a, a lighted window at Uffizi Gallery. And uh, all these are not performers, but uh, they are tourists uh, who take photos of uh, Ponte Vecchio Bridge and the surroundings of uh, Uffizi Gallery. Um, you can't imagine the real story of the photo unless you know it. And this is exactly what happens when we speak about class two. Um, we see what we know and uh, we don't know many of the details and many of our mistakes, so we don't see them. I like recipes and I like recipes not only as a mother who likes to cook for family, but I like recipes as a clinician, a clinician uh, and I love clinical dentistry. Uh, so I believe that everywhere, even in dentistry, in clinical dentistry, there is a recipe. And we must follow the basic steps, know the ingredients and the, prepar the preparation and move on. And uh, of course, um, we can improvise, but in order to improvise, uh, at the first steps, we must uh, be very much attached uh, to uh, the um, initial uh, recipe. Um, let's uh, discuss some facts about class two restoration. Composite is the first choice direct restorative material for class one and class two restorations in posterior region. The clinical survival exceeds 90% after five years and 80% after 10 years. The success is not only material dependent, but also linked first to patient related factors such as bruxism, caries risk and socioeconomic status. Secondly, to tooth-related factors, such as the amount and quality of the residual tooth structure. And third, um, operator-related factors. From all the above, you understand that we speak about a technique 
sensitive procedure. The critical aspect of a class two are good marginal adaptation, correct occlusal anatomy, well contoured proximal walls with strong and well positioned contact points, correct buccal, lingual and proximal emergence profiles. And when we perform our restorative treatment, we try to balance three aspects. First, optimizing tooth form. Secondly, minimal intervention and enhanced aesthetics, which is of great demand nowadays. About contact points or uh, surfaces, let's discuss um, about uh, the term. The contact area is a term used to denote the proximal height of contour of the mesial and distal surfaces of the tooth. The contact areas between primary molars are broader, flatter and situated further gingivally than the contact points between permanent molars. A well contoured, properly positioned firm proximal contact is essential to maintain the integrity of the dental arches and the health of the supporting structures. Uh, this is a very, very interesting study. And you see that the contact points between primary molars are categorized like this, like uh, in the left part uh, of the slide. We have the open contact, we have the X-shaped contact, the I-shaped and the S-shaped. You're going to ask, why is this so much important to categorize our contact points between primary or permanent molars? Uh, of course, you suppose that this uh, gives us some implications for caries, but remember that we have some implications also for matrix system because you choose your matrix system after you inspect very, very carefully the interdental space, uh, the interdental anatomy and the embrasures. Uh, and then after that, you can uh, personalize the matrix system that you are going to use uh, for restoring class two uh, cavities. The anatomic characteristics for permanent teeth are the following. Proximal surface presents a concavity from cement enamel junction almost to the contact areas and follows a decidedly convex shape up to the crest of the marginal ridge. Contact area is oval shaped in a buccal lingual direction and it is located about one millimeter from occlusal ridges and contact areas form the apex of the triangle space which is normally filled with the interdental papilla. This picture is from a very, very important article of Van Mierbeek et al, but actually is uh, a series of three articles, each of them dedicated uh, to specific parts of the class two workflow. You see in that picture that when we speak about the conduct area, we speak about the area in uh, the blue cycle which is about 1.5 to 2 millimeter. Correct contour from occlusal view results in a contact located at the transition between the middle and the buccal third. 
and also from buccal view the proximal contact area is positioned at the maximum contour of the proximal surface. This is located at the transition between the middle occlusal third in a cervical occlusal direction, which is again the blue uh, cycle in the third part of uh, the right, uh, the left picture. And remember that a correct emergence profile and well-positioned uh, contact area results in the formation of an occlusal and gingival embrasure, which are uh, the red lines uh, in the second and third part of the left picture. In this uh, photo, uh, in um, the left part, you see a very famous painting uh, of uh, the painter uh, Egon Siele, and it is called The Four Trees. And in the right part of the picture, um, we see again four trees, but these four trees are near my uh, home. It is a photo of my husband, and you see four trees at the seashore during sunset, sunset. And when I saw the photo, it uh, reminded me unexpectedly uh, the painting of uh, Egon Seel. What we are trying to do with our restorations is to resemble nature, is to reproduce nature in a way that it is, of course, affected but effective, but also repeatable. And we are going to start the practical part of our webinar with a comparison. And uh, we are going to com uh, compare the air turbine hand pieces uh, and electrical hand pieces. The electrical hand pieces which I prefer, have low speed and high torque. They resist extreme pressures. They don't bog down with pressure. They have less vibration, less noise, but they are more expensive, heavier, and um, you must use shorter, more control strokes and reliable support points. My best friend for all restorative procedures is the red band handpiece, speed increasing, a contra angle handpiece, uh, one um, to uh, five. And uh, I have changed my unit in order uh, to have um, uh, the opportunity to use directly whenever I want this ren uh, band hand piece. I, I can't work without uh, this electrical hand piece. And now uh, we're going to make a comparison. We're going to use uh, a pear shaped diamond bar from Microcopy uh, with uh, the air turbine bar and with uh, an electric hand piece. We have a model group. This is the air turbine. And you listen, the very sharp and intense noise of the air turbine. And now we are going to use exactly the same diamond bar with an electric fan piece. We have a shorter, more gentle noise with less vibrations and still effective. You understand? from the difference between the two noises that 
uh, the, uh, a, a, the electric hand piece is much more comfortable for a young patient. And now we are going to make the same comparison with the same pear-shaped bar, but not in a model tooth, uh, but in a real tooth. Uh, of course, a premolar extracted for orthodontic reasons. We are going to use uh, the hair uh, And now the electric hand piece, and you see that I have total control, a more gentle noise, less vibrations, characteristics that are much more important for a pediatric uh, patient. That is why I prefer the electric handpiece. I, I could never imagine, I would never imagine that you would go to a war, to a real war, uh, with a fake or toy weapon. In the same way, I never, never combine my uh, uh, hand pieces, which are uh, one of, or the most uh, expensive part of my armamentarium uh, with no name or cheap bars for I several reasons. Buy cheap or no name bars. The first problem is that the sound of a cheap bar doesn't fit exactly in the hand piece. As you can see here, I insert a no name bar and I detach it very, very easily. On the other hand, when I use a microcopy bar, which is especially designed to fit exactly in the sound of the handpiece, you see that I try to detach it and nothing happens. A tip bar, with, which is not securely placed in the handpiece, hasn't a stable rotation and we can't be accurate in removing dental caries. Let's see now two different videos with the red hand piece and two different bars. Uh, you see that with uh, a no-name bar, there are more vibrations and a lot of effort, and we don't have a deep cut. On the contrary, uh, with the microcopy bar, we, we are much more effective and we have a deeper cut with less effort. And we are very precise to define the margins of our cavity. In conclusion, with a quality bar, we decrease handpiece wear and tear stress and we increase our comfort and protect our risk. Companies um, manufacture not only equipment, but also materials uh, designed for a general dentistry, and they are trying to persuade us that we can use them as they are or uh, with small changes uh, to our patients, but we know exactly the different demands that we have as pediatric dentists. And of course, obviously, the first difference is the size. And in this picture, you see uh, the occlusal surface of two primary molars, um, model tooth, and uh, a pear shaped diamond bar uh, of typical size designed from microcopy for general dentists. But in the right part of the picture, you see a, a pear shaped diamond bar designed for pediatric use. And you see here 
the different size, I have a shorter shank and of course a more tiny head of my uh, diamond bar. And at uh, the left part of the picture, you see the comparison with a cotton roll. And you understand how small a pediatric bar must be um, for us. And of course, um, we usually spell to our patients open big, open big, but the question is how big to open? And uh, in this picture, you see again uh, with a different angle, uh, a typical size uh, bar, um, a, and uh, in the right part, you see a smaller uh, pediatric bar, and you see, uh, and you realize from the real picture, even if we have model teeth, um, that it it's mar much more well fitted to the size of the occlusal surface of a primary molar. And even in that photo uh, that I use the uh, isolite system, which you know uh, that it has a, a bite block in order to keep mouth open, even in that case, I have to change uh, the angle of my handpiece with a typical size bar because I don't have enough space. So I love to work with pediatric bars and what I appreciate more um, after 24 years of clinical practice is to feel comfortable during treatment. And uh, as pediatric dentists, you know that uh, we care so much for the protocol, uh, the behavior management, the child, the parent. I don't want uh, to care about my armamentarium. I want to feel confident. And in this video, we are going to see a pediatric bar from microcopy, a pear-shaped bar. And you see that I open and I, um, I try to roughly design the box of my cavity. And the head of my bar is so small, so tiny, that I barely touch the adjusting tooth. And now with a short movement, I design the box uh, very, very easily because uh, of the small size, I can move my bar very, very uh, comfortably in that small interdental space. And now uh, you're going to see uh, before removing caries, uh, the design of my box. The protocol of a class two, the workflow has many, many steps, but we are going to focus only to that two steps, preparation of the cavity and interproximal clearance. The principles of cavity preparation are opening a cavity or removing a poorly fitted restoration, removing infected dentin, evaluating residual tooth tissue, and removing unsupported enamel, and of course, finishing cavity margins. Uh, about our cavity design, we know from 2003 that we need now, because um, we are in bonding uh, ages, uh, that in bonding uh, years, that we need box only preparations and there is no difference in fracture resistance from the old uh, dovetail uh, preparations. 
for the preparation of the cavity, remember that we have to focus in three steps. The first step is to create access to the carious lesion. Remove carious dentin, of course, and then define the cervical step and define also the axial walls of the box for preparation for reconstructive purposes, which is the armamentarium for accessibility and visibility. We need the multiplier handpiece. Uh, we know uh, because we already uh, discussed about the advantages of uh, the electric hand pieces. We need pear shaped bars with rounded head and we prefer the shorter length. And let's see in that um, article of uh, Van Mirbeek and Al why we need these pear shaped bars. The internal cavity angles need to be rounded is uh, this blue line in the inner part of uh, the diagram uh, to decrease the stress imposed on the adhesive interface. That is exactly why we need uh, the, round, um, the round head bars. And of course, uh, we need the physiotomy bars uh, for, uh, to open minimally the secondary anatomy. We're going to discuss each of these steps and uh, round carbide tungsten bars of different sizes to remove caries. About finishing and polishing, we need the flame diamond bars, the round diamond bars, and flame and cap uh, polishers. These are uh, two steps, flame and cap polishers from uh, microcopy. And we have also special interest bars, which are the end cutting bar. This bar has a very special characteristic. This bar can cut only an, at the top of uh, its head and also the interdental bar which have a very very special design and with these two bars you can achieve the interdental clearance. Of course another way as you already know are the sonic tips uh, which are very very uh, good um, and um, they give as a very, very um, good result, acceptable result, but you need a special equipment. And uh, the other problem is that they are more time consuming. So I prefer to use very, very uh, shortly the end cutting bar and the interdental bar. And with these two bars, I have uh, in their proximal clearance immediately. Uh, let's start from the start. The first is pre-wedging because it protects rubber dam and interdental papilla and prevents the bar from damaging the adjusted tooth while prepping the cervical cavity margin and creating interproximal clearance. Uh, another advantage if you use uh, a wooden uh, wedge is that the wedge can be modified by greeting to make a custom wedge for use during reconstructive steps. So uh, to achieve cervical and interproximal protection, we need only the wedge and of course a matrix for the adjusted tooth. How to place the matrix, you can, uh, the wedge, you can place the wedge lingually or buccally and try both ways. And you can insert where the embrasures are wider. 
how to open the cavity. Uh, of course, we have extended cavities and in clearly extended cavities, you can open at the occlusal level because they are already opened. But also we have closed cavities and uh, in that cavities, you must enter behind the marginal ridge. And after you enter exactly behind the marginal ridge, then uh, you continue your preparation in a buccolingual direction. You move your handpiece buccal and lingually, but uh, also you uh, make smaller movements, measly and distally. And as you move uh, your handpiece, uh, bu buccal lingually, the proximal wall is getting thinner. And sometimes you feel that the bar is drilling into nothing as it enters the demineralized area, which has uh, less resistance. So the interproximal wall is gradually weakened to a uh, wicket and uh, you make it easier to remove or it is detached without uh, any other additional step. And now we are going to see how I enter a closed cavity uh, uh, and I'm going uh, to use a peer safe bar uh, behind the marginal reeds. And you see that I move my handpiece with slow movements uh, in a buccal lingual direction. And uh, gradually uh, the proximal wall is getting thinner and thinner. And um, now, in that way, uh, you inspect clearly uh, caries. You see where you have caries and where you must focus. And now uh, you can see in that picture uh, the demineralized, the calcified area. Uh, and uh, in uh, a primary molar, again, the same procedure. Um, I, here I use an electrical handpiece. Um, remember that when I don't use water, it is only for educational purposes. All these videos are under microscope. And if I use um, water, um, you don't see uh, so many uh, details. Uh, I, I um, move my handpiece uh, with smaller movements, measly and distally, but mainly uh, I uh, move it in a buccal lingual direction. And you see that gradually the proximal wall is detached. And now I roughly say design the box of my cavity. And then I'm going to define the proximal walls um, in a following step. Now, uh, the only thing that I want to do is to enter my class two and um, remove the proximal wall. The next step is how to define the axial walls. Remember that when we speak about a class two cavity, we have three different types. Um, the different types are first the uh, red type, um, and uh, this type is not acceptable because it has acute angles and it must be avoided because this area is going to fracture. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm sorry, the type that uh, we um, prefer is uh, the green type uh, because 
in uh, that type, we have approximately 19 degrees between the axial wall and the external surface. And of course, um, sometimes we have uh, the orange type, um, which uh, it has obtuse angles and it is acceptable, but uh, please notice that it would be very, very difficult uh, in uh, the um, angle between the cervical step and uh, the proximal wall to fill that area with your uh, composite. In that case, if I have a, an orange type and I cannot um, have um, due to um, the, the um, area of caries, if I don't have any other option uh, to design differently my cavity, I'm going to use, in that case, a snow blow technique uh, to fill uh, my cavity. In order to define your axial walls, you can use flame bars, sonic tips, and manual tools. Uh, we already discussed that sonic tips are very, very nice, but you need a special equipment and they are more time consuming. And manual tools are not accepted because there is a risk of leaving steps and sharp angles in the transition between the axial wall and the step. So the way that I prefer uh, to achieve the interproximal clearance is different. What we mean with interproximal clearance? We, me we mean that we have buccal and legal margins of the box accessible. Also, uh, the interproximal clearance allows passive positioning of the matrix, which means that uh, you will not have uh, um, the formation of your matrix uh, system. And third, uh, you have visible margins which facilitate finishing, polishing, and repolishing. This is my favorite way to achieve interproximal clearance, the interdental uh, bar, diamond bar. Let's see a simple way to define axial walls in class two. Using an interdental diamond, we made accessible palatal and buccal margins, which allow better cleaning, especially in high-risk patients. Check that during that procedure, very often we reveal remain lesions in a very difficult area, which will lead a secondary caries uh, in the margins. Stay tuned for more. And again, a video. After I roughly design my box, then I'm going to follow with the interproximal clearance and the first step to define the axial walls. I'm going to use the interdental uh, bar. Uh, of microcopy, the interdental diamond bar. And you see that I protect the adjustant tooth uh, with a matrix. And then I'm trying to define uh, the axial walls. Uh, I want to have interproximal clearance and um, again, uh, you see here in that picture that Many times I reveal the decalcified areas and you know that I have to remove that part of the cavity because always our margins must be positioned to healthy tissues and not decalcified areas. How to achieve the interproximal clearance at the cervical step? Flatten the cervical step has many advantages. We have good fit 
for the sectional matrix, good bonding material with ability, good restoration material fit, correct emergence profile in cases that the cervical step is too close to the adjusting tooth. And I'm going uh, to define the cervical step to flatten the, the cervical step with the end cutting bar, which we already discussed about. This bar has a special head and uh, this uh, diamond can cut only at the top of the head. After entering the cavity, the second crucial step in class two preparation is the flattening of the cervical step with end cutting bars of different sizes and grids. The advantages are the good fit for the sectional matrix, the good bonding material wettability, the good restoration material fit, and of course, the correction of the emergence profile in cases where a cervical step is too close to the adjacent tooth. At the end of this procedure, as you can see uh, in the video, with high magnification, I have an excellent result with an easy, simple and repeatable way, just with the use of an end cutting bar and nothing more, uh, which leads at the end in the perfect fit of my matrix uh, in uh, the class two cavity. And uh, again, in this video, uh, we see uh, the end cutting bar in action with just simple movements you see how I flatten in one second my uh, step, my cervical step, without uh, any other effort. And after that, if you have a very well flattened cervical step and interproximal clearance, uh, you see uh, the good fit of my matrix system. very, very well adjusted, not only at the cervical step, but also uh, in the proximal walls uh, area. Another question is to bevel or not to bevel. And we know from literature that in contrast uh, to anterior teeth, uh, preparations uh, of uh, posterior uh, raising composites should not include beveling of the margins because this small uh, part of the composing at uh, the beveled area is going to fracture in the future. What we have to do is to remove undermined enamel to prevent enamel fractures. And um, in that uh, diagram, uh, you see the unsupported enamel prisms, and uh, we know that these areas tend to fracture during polymerization, and this can create a white line or open margin in long term. So what we do is that we round off our margins with flame-shaped diamond bars used in a, with a dry and medium speed. And uh, also we already discussed that margins must not be located in demineralized enamel to prevent caries reoccurrence. And we smooth the margins with discs and elastics. Uh, you see some from uh, the collection of uh, microcopy and then let's discuss how to handle secondary anatomy. If we don't have implication for caries, then uh, what we can do is just to seal uh, with um, a sealant all the secondary anatomy and uh, we see um, 
the final photo. But in some cases that uh, we have suspicion of caries or we have uh, also X-rays that prove that, um, we open with rounded uh, diamonds. This uh, diamond is uh, again from microcopy, but it is uh, in magnification, actually is very, very tiny. And I open the palatal groove uh, with that um, round shaped diamond. But uh, for uh, the occlusal uh, grooves, the occlusal surface, I use a flame shaped bar. This is uh, a tiny pediatric flame bar with short head uh, and short sang. And of course, the success sequence ends uh, with polishing and finishing. And my best friend is this pediatric uh, diamond bar. It is uh, flame shaped, but it is so small. Uh, and the head of the bar is very, very tiny and you can move uh, very effectively in that sensitive area of the embrasure to remove flashes. Um, and of course, then around with the same uh, bar, uh, the, margin, uh, the marginal ridge. It is very, very effective. And the elastics, um, we use the elastics. This is a two-step elastic from microcopy. We dry the tooth and we use a rubber cap, low speed, gentle pressure. But we have to polish from the center to the periphery uh, like this in different direction and keep the powder. And we will explain uh, in a following step why. And also uh, we use uh, these mini flame tips, uh, dry tooth, uh, low speed, gentle pressure. We use them without water, but uh, you can use air to avoid high temperature. Uh, this uh, elastic, the flame shape, works at the crevices of the occlu occlusal surface, but you must give an inclination and work only at the tooth, tooth restoration interface. You need to touch only the tooth restoration interface. And at the end, I, at the end, I love to polish my restoration with a simple, clean, synthetic, soft brush. Uh, and I work with the powder created at the previous step, dry and low speed. And uh, a special issue about class two cavities is that sometimes we want to preserve fragile, healthy enamel at the cervical shoulder. And uh, we have this small area of enamel, which is unsupported by denting. And if you place your wedge, then you can have a fracture. So what you can do is to carry out the bonding procedure without the matrix, then fill the cervical gap with flowable composite, spread with a pointed instrument like fissura and like cure, and then proceed with uh, the wedge and matrix. And we want to preserve this healthy enamel at the cervical Shoulder, uh, shoulder, because we know from literature that the fracture strength in composite class two restorations that extend below cemento enamel junction, which means without available cervical enamel, 
is significantly lower than when the restoration margin is located coronally to the cemento-enamel junction with available cervical enamel. So you must always preserve that sensitive part of enamel. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank you for your interest. And of course, I would like to thank our uh, sponsor, Microcopy. Uh, if you're interested um, about uh, the products, uh, you can scan uh, the QR code in uh, your screen. Um, you can uh, contact me in any way if you have questions uh, to answer or some um, details that uh, you want to uh, define uh, more. Um, Luther King, uh, Simon Sinek says that Luther King gave the I have a dream speech, not uh, the I have a plan speech. And dreams change the course of history. So I really dream to meet all of you at uh, the third global summit at Porto uh, on next uh, November. And um, you know that the topic uh, is uh, amazing, pulp therapy rooted in evidence, but it's not only an opportunity for uh, knowledge, but an opportunity to meet uh, all uh, together. And uh, please uh, be a part of this vibrant, scientific community because individually we are, a, we are a drop. Together we are uh, an ocean. And let's meet again uh, at Cape Town in 2025. Thank you very, very much.